get started. So, hello everyone. Thank you again for joining. I'm Tracy, the founder of Braca Strong. We're here to empower, inspire, advocate, and support women who are survivors, survivors, and thrivers to help women through their journeys and eliminate the feeling of isolation. During COVID-19, it's kind of changed our vision a little bit with fundraisers and events. So we've decided to go ahead and host educational calls to continue to educate our community as knowledge is power. And I'm a true advocate. The more information you have, the easier the decisions are to make in life. And tonight we have Dr. John Diaz coming on for oncology, gynecology, and we're excited and thankful that he came on tonight and would like to pass over the mic to Dr. Diaz. Tracy, can you hear me? Yes. So thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for joining. So I'm trying to figure out my MacBook is acting up, but if you guys lose the audio, let me know. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're clear now. Oh, we lost you. Zoom issues. All right. So we'll try and keep things kind of informal tonight. If you guys have questions, I know Tracy has you uh, muted just to make uh, some of the background noise, but feel free to interrupt, to raise your hands. Um, you can make this as informal as you guys want. I mean, this is for you guys, so thanks again for inviting me. I'm gonna share my screen just as a non-visual learner. Um, but again, if you guys have any questions or anything, jump in and we'll have plenty of time to answer some things at the end. So this is where I work. Um, it's the Miami Cancer Institute. It's down in Miami and it's part of the Baptist Health System. We're Alliance members with more and the benefits for that is we're working towards where clinical trials, when they're opened up in New York, will open up simultaneously here down in South Florida. So patients no longer have to travel to New York or Houston or Boston to have access to some of the latest trials. And we have a pretty robust portfolio now. I lead all of our clinical trial research efforts. Um, and it's a great way for you guys to have access to clinical trials. So we're going to talk today a little bit about the genes associated with breast and brain cancer, which I know you guys are very familiar with. We're going to talk a little bit about risk reducing strategies and also talk about some of the surgeries that we use to try and obtain these results. So our goal obviously is to cure cancer. Okay. And the question is how best do we go about this? And the best way is knowledge. And that's one of the things that tracing this group does so well is to get the knowledge out there to patients, family members, and understand what's going on with these diseases. So genetics is hereditary, obviously, right? And your genes are oftentimes what can predispose you to some of these cancers. So when it comes to breast and ovarian cancer, like most cancers, the majority of cases are sporadic. They're actually not inherited. Um, about five to 10% of cancers and 90% are not hereditary, although we're learning more and more about this. So the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer with this is like BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. But there's also Lynch syndrome, and this is hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome. And this was initially discovered in men who had colon cancer. And what we found as we started finding these families out is that the women in these families also had colon cancer. Um, but the women in these families actually had uterine cancer, we call endometrial cancer, just as frequently. And we know that in that group, there's about a 10% risk of developing ovarian cancer. So these are the two big genetic syndromes that we're familiar with that put patients at risk for ovarian cancers. You guys are probably familiar with BRCA1 and BRCA2, obviously, right? This is an autosomal dominant trait. And what that means is, is that it's carried through from generation to generation. Um, not everyone will be affected, and that has to do with penetrance, but it is carried through in the family. And so you can see here 
if you have one affected parent, like you see here, the father and an unaffected mother, their children have about a 50% risk of inheriting this gene, which would put them potentially at risk of developing one of these cancers. So these are the numbers when you look at lifetime risk of developing either breast or ovarian cancer. One mutation, as you guys know, you're up to a 60% chance of developing breast cancer. That group has about as high as a 40% chance lifetime of developing ovarian cancer. With BRCA2, again, breast cancer risk a little bit similar. You see with ovarian cancer, that drops to about 15 to 25%. Lynch syndrome is not associated with breast cancer, but there's about a 6 20% risk of developing ovarian cancer and about a 40 to 60% chance of developing endometrial cancer. With BRCA1, we now know that there's an increased risk of not necessarily developing endometrial cancer, but if you get endometrial cancer, you're more likely for it to be what's called serous type, which is a more aggressive type of cancer. And there are more genes now that we're starting to develop. So PALB2 has become very popular. Uh, we find it more and more in breast cancer patients. And we know there's an increased risk in ovarian cancer. RAD51 is another gene that we've identified that also increases the risk of both breast and ovarian cancer. So as we continue to grow our knowledge about this, we're starting to see that certain genes are putting you at increased risk. So it's no longer just BRCA1 and BRCA2. I know this is a BRCA strong, um, but there are other genes that are involved in this. So if you carry this hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, again, you're at increased risk of breast cancer. We know that, and you're about a 15 to 40% chance of developing ovarian cancer. Interestingly, in men, with a BRCA2 mutation, I have increased risk of developing breast cancer um, and also prostate cancer. That's important because women at least are getting their mammograms done. If you're a man, you're not going for mammograms, you're not doing self breast exams. So if you carry a BRCA2 mutation with men, you have increased risk for breast cancer and they do need to undergo breast cancer screening. So here's looking at breast cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2, common, ovarian cancer common in both. Pancreatic cancer is associated with BRCA2 mutations and men and who carry the BRCA2 gene and increased risk of prostate, breast, and pancreatic cancer. Remember I said before, if you carry a BRCA1 mutation, you may be at increased risk of endometrial cancer. It's really that serous type. And we also know if you're on tamoxifen, that increases your risk of endometrial cancer. So when we talk a little about what you can do to decrease this risk, such as risk reducing surgery, about history, is that something that's relevant or not? So who should undergo testing for genetic syndromes? Well, if you have multiple family members, Members with ovarian okay. If you have breast cancer, young at age of 50, you're at increased risk. If you have both breast and ovarian cancer patients, or an Oscar Jewish answer, these people should all be screened for having a BRCA1 or 2 or hereditary cancer syndrome. In the general population, BRCA mutation is low, 0.1%. Ashkenazi Jewish populations, 2%. And if you have a strong family history, about 50 to 80%. If you're Ashkenazi Jewish descent and you have a personal breast cancer history, you have a 12% risk. And down here in South Florida, it's important Hispanics actually have a higher risk than Caucasians and African Americans for cancer BRC mutation. So you don't think about that, but again, South Florida is important. So these patients are at risk and should be counseled appropriately. So this is Angela Jolie. I think you guys are all familiar with her. You know that she has the genetic mutation and she's very open about this. Um, she started having a risk reducing breast surgery and then went on to go have her ovaries removed. So if you have breast cancer, the question I get a lot from my patients is what's my risk of developing ovarian cancer and what can I do to reduce that risk? So ovarian cancer, thankfully, is not a very common cancer. Only about one in 70 women will develop ovarian cancer, lifetime risk about 1.4%. As we saw before, if you carry a BRCA mutation, that increases up to 40%. And if you have a personal history of breast cancer, but no family history and you don't carry genetic mutation, your risk is about 5%, which is kind of low. But again, if you watch the evening news, they would tell you it's three times higher than the general population. So who should undergo genetic testing? Anyone diagnosed with ovarian cancer should be offered. Any woman diagnosed with breast cancer now should be offered genetic testing. And any woman who's of Oscar's Jewish descent should be offered genetic testing. If you have a strong family history of either breast, ovarian, uterine, colon, or pancreatic cancer, you should see a genetic counselor and see if you qualify for genetic testing. Again, what's our goal? It's to cure cancer. And the best way to do that is through prevention. So some of the risk-reducing strategies are lifestyle modifications. 
I know that sounds funny and people don't think about it, but there's countless studies to demonstrate that exercise helps reduce your risk of cancer. Um, we're seeing now, unfortunately, with COVID, those patients who are really suffering the most from COVID and have the worst outcomes are those patients who have other diseases, either obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Those are the ones that are increased risk of having a complication of COVID. Vaccination is a way to prevent, we'll talk about that, screening and surgery. So again, diet and exercise, toxins. So we're talking about here is cigarette smoking, right? So cigarette smoking is an increased risk for lung cancer. And we know that excess alcohol increases your risk for breast cancer, okay? Things we'd all should be doing, get enough sleep, managing our stress, and being sure to ask for help. If you need help for both practical and emotional support, these things are important. And all these things that can help reduce our stress really do have a positive impact on your health and also decreasing your risk of cancer. I know we're gonna talk about ovarian and breast cancer, but I want to talk a little bit about the HPV vaccine. So HPV is the infection that results in cervical cancer. And there's a vaccination called Gardasil 9, which protects you against nine different strands of the HPV vaccine, including those that cause genital warts. And it's recommended for all boys from age nine to 26. And two years ago, the FDA expanded that approval now to age of 45. So even if you have an abnormal pap smear, you still benefit from trying to prevent this. And again, the idea here is to expose your body to the HPV so it develops antibodies against it and prevents the infection resulting in cervical changes that ultimately going to lead to cervical cancer. So get your pap smears beginning age 21, regardless of age of sexual intercourse. And now it's kind of changed. It used to be every year. Now you're looking at doing both your pap smear and HPV testing if you're over the age of 30. And if both of those are negative, you only need to year. But your screening, if they're both negative, only needs to be done every three years. And you guys know this breast cancer screening should begin about age 40 to 45, the screening mammograms, um, definitely by age 45 to 55. Okay. After 55, the Prevent Task Force recommends every two years. Um, but I think most women, most physicians recommend yearly mammography. Again, and we're here to talk about breast and ovarian cancer, but colon cancer screening really should begin by the age of 45, okay? And there are a couple of different ways to do this. You can do a stool-based test, and you can do this with your primary care physician, okay? Or you can undergo a colonoscopy, and that can be done every 10 years. But again, colon cancer, preventative cancer, with appropriate screening, we can catch these things early when it's treatable and curable. So those women who are at the highest risk, breast cancer, should be good annual screening 10 years prior to the youngest family member, but not before age 30. So again, here we're talking about our BRCA positive patients, okay? You really should consider 3D mammography, and we offer that uh, at our cancer center. And then annual breast MRIs, okay? Again, beginning 10 years prior to the youngest family member. And so a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll get screened every six months. They'll do a mammogram. Six months later, do the MRI. Six months later, mammogram. Six months later, MRI. So you're having an MRI done every year in your mammogram at a year old training, six months apart. For our BRCA positive patients, we perform ovarian cancer screening, and that includes doing an ultrasound and a CA125, which is a blood test, every six months. We do this until patients are ready to do something more definitive in ovarian cancer. Because we do this, but know that no study has ever shown that it does what we want it to do, which is to try and catch ovarian cancer when it's early and treatable. And so it's the best that we can offer, but it's really not a good screening method. It's not like pap smears, mammographies. Other things we can do are breast cancer is drugs such as oxifen. Again, a lot of patients will take us after initial diagnosis to prevent both a recurrence or a contralateral breast cancer. Okay. And these other serums kind of work in the same way. The idea is to decrease your circulating estrogen. And believe it or not, ovarian cancer, chemo prevention is birth control pills. I know there's some information out there that birth control pills may cause um, some harm. In fact, our BRSA positive patients, who again, aren't ready to do something more definitive. We put them on birth control pills because it decreases your risk of developing ovarian cancer. If you're on birth control pills for more than five years, you decrease your risk by 50%. There's some data suggests that being on birth control pills may increase your risk of breast cancer. There's just as much data suggests it does not. The difference is with breast cancer, we do have screening. With ovarian cancer, we have no way to screen. 
So the benefits greatly outweigh the risk of this. And then the other thing is risk reducing surgery. And the idea is to remove healthy tissue, okay, before it develops cancer. So reduce the risk of breast cancer, one of the things that they do are risk reducing mastectomy. The most common is a skin spray mastectomy, okay? And this decreases your risk by over 90%, but it's not 100 of eliminating that risk of breast cancer. And what you always counsel your patients is there's also a small risk, about 3%, that at the time of this risk-reducing procedure, when we send a specimen to pathology, we may find a small cancer already hiding. And so again, these are the most common ones, the skin sparing, uh, nipple sparing mastectomies that are performed nowadays. Um, depending on the breast tissue and the breast size, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll put um, an infusion under the skin and they'll start developing the skin. And when then you're ready, then they'll switch out from um, your expanders to silicone implants. And again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. When it comes to the GYN and do risk reducing, one of, I think it's always important to go over some anatomy. So there's a little bit, again, misconception. So here you can see this is the uterus. These are your ovaries and your fallopian tubes, right? So this here, that circle, then that orange, circle there is what's called a hysterectomy. This is where we remove the uterus and the cervix. This is what's called a total hysterectomy. It has nothing to do with the ovaries, okay? That's a separate procedure. A partial hysterectomy is when you remove just the uterus and you leave the cervix behind. There's really no indication for doing this. Um, again, nothing to do with the ovaries. So oftentimes patients think a partial hysterectomy means you leave the ovaries behind. And a total hysterectomy means you take those. Again, this refers only to the uterus. Salpingectomy is where you remove the fallopian tubes, okay? And this, a lot of times, will, will be done at a time of C-section to try and prevent future pregnancies. Oophorectomy is removing the ovaries, okay? And then in South Florida, we say the procedure called sacramento todo, which is what's called a total hysterectomy, lateral salpingectomy. And that's removing the uterus, the cervix, both tubes, and both ovaries. By removing the ovaries, you decrease your risk of developing brain cancer, okay? Same thing, there's about a 2 to 3% chance of finding the cancer already hiding there, okay? And it's also important to know that removing your ovarian cancer, removing the ovaries, I'm sorry, really decrease the risk of ovarian cancer, but it's not 0%. And there's also an entity called peritoneal cancer. And there's about a 1.5% of developing peritoneal cancer. So the way we do this nowadays is really risk-reducing surgery is robotically. And so here you see a picture of what the robot looks like. That's the robotic platform there. Uh, you can see in the foreground, that's the surgeon sitting. Um, and that's where we control the robot. We have our assistant, the robot at the bedside. And those are some incisions you see from a robotic surgery. They're small eight millimeter incisions. Um, patients go home the same day after a hysterectomy. It used to be, you know, my, my mom had hers done. She was in the hospital for five days. That's not the case anymore. So for lack of removing the ovaries, the benefits are, again, it decreases ovarian cancer risk. It decreases the risk of a recurrence of your breast cancer. There's also that emotional benefit or the big fear of developing ovarian cancer, okay? But it has its risk. You lose your estrogen and that can impact your heart, your bones, okay? Um, there's the effects of hormone replacement therapy in the breast, which we'll talk a little bit, breast cancer risk, and the emotional risk around, you know, a lot of times women, the idea of removing their ovaries is removing kind of part of their womanhood. Also now an idea about removing the fallopian tubes. We know that a lot of what we used to think was ovarian cancer is now actually fallopian tube cancer. And so by removing the fallopian tubes, you decrease your risk of ovarian cancer, really fallopian tube cancer, and you don't impact the ovaries. Um, so let's say if we have a very young patient, um, BR positive, who's at increased risk, and she's done having children, but yet, not yet ready to remove her ovaries, um, then this be, be kind of like a partial uh, way to reduce her risk without yet removing the ovaries. Um, and it's become now standard of care if you're going to have a hysterectomy for a reason, fibroids or whatnot, to remove the fallopian tubes at the time of hysterectomy and leave the ovaries behind. Again, this is the idea of the 
the opportunistic stop injecting me. So if you're going to go ahead and have hysterectomy anyways, take out the fallopian tubes. And in those women, let's say they're a BRCA2 mutation. So their risk of developing ovarian cancer is later in life. Um, but they're done with having kids in their mid-30s. This may be a way to kind of decrease that risk and bridge the gap until they're ready to remove their ovaries. So this is a hysterectomy you guys are seeing here. And again, one of the questions I get asked all the time is what about the uterus? So this is a robotic hysterectomy. Um, that instrument you see right there is what's called the vessel sealer. Um, it seals and then a knife comes out and cuts the tissue at the same time. Um, so we talked before with if you have a BRCA1 mutation that puts you not an increased risk of developing endometrial cancer, but if you develop endometrial cancer, you have an increased risk of it being a more aggressive serous type. Um, and so here you can see where on the left is the uterus. On the right, that white area that the instruments went on to is where the ovary is. So again, if you have a Lynch syndrome and your increased risk of developing endometrial cancer, that'd be another reason to remove the uterus. So my patients who, let's say, maybe are a little bit older, they're BRCA1 positive, they're going to be on tamoxifen, they're overweight, they already have a couple of risks factor for developing endometrial cancer. Some of them may at the time of doing a risk reducing surgery for their ovaries elect to go ahead and remove the uterus as well. Um, and again, this is a robotic hysterectomy. Like I said, our patients go home the very same day. Um, they can drive seven to 10 days after the procedure. I tell them to ask for three weeks off from work, but really most of them go back to work about 10 to 12 days after the procedure. Um, they go home with Tylenol and an anti-inflammatory. They have something a little bit stronger in case they need it, but most of my patients don't even take it. So on that right side, again, there you see that vessel sealing device. It has a bipolar energy source and a knife that comes And all, all this is being done with eight millimeter incisions. Um, so again, really has changed the way we perform hysterectomies. Um, patients have a much quicker return to life, much quicker return to work, um, less pain, um, and a lot better outcomes. So should you have a hysterectomy? Uh, well, if you're a BRCA1 carrier, maybe. Uh, we know you have a slightly increased risk of having a serous endometrial cancer. If you're gonna be on tamoxifen, we know tamoxifen works great as an anti-estrogen for the breast, but it's a pro-estrogen for the uterus. And so it increases your risk of developing uterine cancer. About one in a thousand to one in 2,000 women on tamoxifen will develop uterine cancer. Um, it also kind of simplifies your hormone replacement therapy. And we'll talk about that. So if you have your uterus in place and you're gonna take hormone replacement therapy, you need both estrogen and progesterone because estrogen alone would increase the risk of developing endometrial cancer. So if you remove your uterus, then you only need estrogen, and it looks like it's the combination of estrogen and progesterone that actually increases your risk of developing breast cancer. And like we said before, if you're obese, um, that might be a risk factor for endometrial cancer. So Tracy, I'm going to talk about a little bit of hormone therapy. Um, if you are a breast cancer patient, um, we really don't recommend hormone placement therapy for those patients. And the reason being is what was called the HABITS trial. So this was a randomized control trial. And they took women who had breast cancer and were postmenopausal, and they placed them on hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and they compared it to a group of women who were not on hormone replacement therapy. And what we found was those women, again, with a history of breast cancer, had a recurrence about twice as often. So it was 22% of those women had a development of their breast cancer recurrence compared to 8%. And so this trial kind of warned us about using hormone replacement therapy in breast cancer patients. Right around the same time, the Stockholm trial was ongoing. Um, when the HABITS trial came out, they kind of stopped their trial early. And when they looked at the women they had enrolled, and it was about 50 women in each arm, again, it looked like using hormone therapy increased your risk of contralateral breast cancer. So, we don't usually recommend hormone therapy for those women who have a history of breast cancer. And again, the concern always there is that breast cancer tends to be an estrogen receptor positive cancer. But the real question is what about our BRCA1 patients or our BRCA2 patients who 
don't have cancer, they carry this diagnosis and they perform the risk reducing surgery. Either they remove their breast tissue and or they also remove their ovaries. So we try first non-hormonal options. Um, and that's again for menopausal symptoms or osteoporosis prevention, okay? But if that doesn't work, hormone therapy is reasonable. Uh, and there've been some trials that have looked at this and in the BRSA one and two patients, again, without a history of breast cancer, using hormone replacement therapy, especially in the premenopausal women, did not seem to increase your risk of developing breast cancer. Uh, and again, if you remove the uterus at the time of surgery, that kind of simplifies it where you're only taking estrogen. And when you looked at the WHI study, the women who were on hormone replacement therapy, if they took estrogen and progesterone, those seem to be the ones that had an increased risk of developing breast cancer. If they were on estrogen alone, they didn't seem to have an increased risk. So in our BRCA1 and 2 patients, um, we removed their ovaries, let's say in their late 30s or 40s, uh, replacement therapy. If they've had their uterus out, it can be estrogen alone. And the recommendation really is to try and do a transdermal patch. Affects the most efficacious patients. Uh, we usually take that along until about age of 51 when they would hit normal menopause and then we kind of try and titrate that off. So one of the things Tracy wanted me to kind of talk about was ovarian cancer. Um, and I guess I would say with ovarian cancer is we've really come a long way in the last couple of years with ovarian cancer. Uh, ovarian cancer is not a very common cancer. It's only about 22,000 cases a year. And as I said before, there's really no way to screen for ovarian cancer. Um, when we find it, we usually find it at an advanced stage and the treatment is a combination of both surgery and chemotherapy. Um, and although we find it at an advanced stage, we are able to place most women into remission, about 85% of women. Um, unfortunately, most of those women, the cancer does come back. We've gotten better with our chemotherapy agents, but something that's really changed the treatment of ovarian cancer are PARP inhibitors. So when I was a fellow at Sloan Kettering, we did our first phase one trial with a new drug called PARPs. And that was over 10 years ago. And over the last three years, these drugs have come to market. So two years ago, PARPs became approved as maintenance therapy with ovarian cancer. We saw an improvement in their survival that we've never seen before in the management of ovarian cancer. Last year, using PARP inhibitors in the upfront setting. And again, we've seen improvement in women's ovarian cancer outcomes that we've never seen before. So last month, the FDA approved a combination of one PARP with bevacizumab in the upfront setting. And in those women, they had a progression-free survival of 37.7 months. Without that treatment, it was 12 months. So it's had a huge impact in the treatment for women. Two years ago, there was also, I'm sorry, two months ago, there was an approval for an Araparib PARP, a single agent for all comers. Women who do the best with PARP are those who have a BRCA mutation, either germline, so in other words, you carry it in your blood and you pass it to your family members, or if the tumor itself is only going to change, it's called somatic mutation. And again, this has really changed the management of brain cancer. It's been really exciting the last two years with PARP inhibitors, first as treatment, then a second line maintenance, and now it's up in the upfront setting. job of funding women's cancers. So look at clinical trial funding. Um, prostate cancer is the best funded cancer. Prostate cancer, as we all know, men die with prostate cancer. They don't die from prostate cancer. Um, and it's ridiculous how much funding goes to prostate cancer. Next is breast. But look where the other GYN cancers are. Ovarian, cervix, uterine, there's really minimal funding for these cancers. So we need to do a better job of funding research for these cancers. And the best way to do this is a great website, the Foundation for Women's Cancers. Um, they've not, but this is very much made for survivors, for women. Um, it's a great uh, website for information on various cancers, genetic information, and how to get involved with funding. So I encourage all of you guys to get a chance over the long weekend, the cruise the web, go to this website, get involved, and I think make it something you guys can kind of visit frequently. So the best cure for cancer is prevention. 
we got to maximize those modifiable risk factors, diet, exercise, stress, toxins, explore other risk reducing surgeries, early screening and surveillance for these cancers. And some patients may benefit from risk reducing surgeries, especially where screening is not available, such as ovarian cancer. So thank you for your time. I'll go back to Tracy and we can go over and again, make this informal as you guys like. Perfect. What I'll do is if you guys want to raise your hand for those who have questions and then I can just call on you. I think it might be a little easier than people just calling out. Um, Tammy, go ahead. So um, a couple of questions. I'm BRCA1 positive and a two-time ovarian cancer survivor. I had a full, a full hysterectomy with Dr. Tangier here in um, Memorial, the robotic hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. How often, once you have everything removed, should you still check? And I was also informed that I, w I couldn't take any hormones at all. So I'm like miserably suffering through menopause um, because of my BRCA gene, <laughs> you know, like miserably suffering through menopause. So my two like follow-up questions are, how often am I supposed to go back for um, checkups since I don't have any you know, reproductive organs in, inside and, and what can I do? I, you, so I'm hearing mixed reviews about hormones. Some doctors are saying if you have BRCA, if you're BRCA1 positive, absolutely no hormones, no matter what. And then, you know, what you're, I'm, I'm now I'm not sure what's the right response, you know, what to do, because I would love a way to feel better because I'm exhausted and hot all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so Tammy, did you say you had ovarian cancer? I had it when I was, yeah, I had it when I was 19. Um, but it was, I was, I was caught, it was caught very early. You know, my, I, my mother who passed away from cancer, um, but she kind of handled everything cause I was so mm -hmm. young and then I got it again later on and then just decided to do the full hysterectomy. Like I'm done with this, you know? Yeah. So again, so two separate things, unfortunately. So one thing is being a BRSA one or two carrier and not having a history of cancer. I have a very heavy versus history. having a history of cancer. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a personal history of either breast or ovarian cancer, then hormone therapy becomes a little bit more challenging um, because both breast and ovarian cancer tend to be estrogen receptor positive cancers. So if you have a personal history of cancer. Jacob, um, you're probably not a good candidate for hormone replacement therapy. Now, having said that, there are other ways to treat it, uh, and depends what are the goals or what are the symptoms we're trying to treat. So if what bothers you the most are hot flashes, there are non-hormonal ways to treat it, um, and there are some drugs on the market that can help treat hot flashes. Nothing gets rid of hot flashes 100% not even estrogen. But the goal is to kind of decrease the frequency in which they're coming and decrease their intensity. So they are non-hormonal uh, options available. Um, as far as some of the other symptoms that sometimes can be experiencing, vaginal dryness, things like that, there are some topical um, creams that can be used, both that are non-hormonal, like Replens. Um, you can get that on Amazon, since no one's leaving the house nowadays. Um, there's also a new medication called IntraRose, which is a pre-estrogen. It's a cream that you can put in the vagina, and then locally in the vagina, it converts into estrogen. Um, there have been some studies with breast cancer patients on that, um, and so that's a potential option. It does produce some local estrogen in the vagina. Um, you know, the risk of that are probably very low, and so something you can talk to Jacob about. Um, but I would agree, if you have a personal history of cancer, uh, then unfortunately you're, you're probably not a good candidate for hormones. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was hoping that maybe <laughs> um, he was wrong. <laughs> Anna, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask how long is it recommended to be in a, um, taking estrogen? I have a total hysterectomy. This will be my sixth year. And I think I have heard like maybe to around like the 10 year, maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure. How long should I keep it? Is it like any, should I keep on taking it? I mean. 
Yeah, so that, that's one of the hardest questions is if you have a patient who's on hormone replacement therapy, um, they often feel pretty good on their hormone replacement therapy. And so trying to take a patient off it can be hard because they're not going to feel as good, at least initially. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, when you look at ACOG's recommendations, they say that you should be on the lowest dose of hormone replacement therapy for the shortest amount of time possible. Now, what exactly does that mean? You know, average age of menopause is 51.3 years. So if we do have a BRCA positive patient that we remove their ovaries at 35, we might want to put that person on some kind of hormone replacement therapy till about 51 and then maybe titrate them off. If you're postmenopausal and you're on hormone replacement therapy, then again, the question becomes, okay, what are my goals of this treatment? Um, understanding that at some point you probably have to go off this therapy. But again, when that happens, you're going to go into menopause and you're going to have the side effects of menopause, which are not particularly pleasant. Um, and so it's difficult. So there's no hard and rule fast as far as how long to be on it once you're in menopause. Um, but at some point you should consider titrating off of it. Is it something that if, like I said, I think last couple of times that I went to see my doctor, he was out and I ended up seeing somebody else and she was telling me to like, maybe like lower the dosage. I mean, I don't know even look again, when do you decide that it's a good time to, to start doing that? Yeah, so I would definitely would not stop cold turkey. Um, so lowering the dosage is a good idea so that you can get your body used to the idea. Uh, same thing as kind of when you go into menopause. It's not like you magically at 51.3 years stop producing estrogen. You gradually go into menopause. Uh, and even in menopause, your ovaries continue to produce estrogen even to the age of 65. Um, so I would talk with whoever's managing your hormones about kind of a gradual taper off your hormones. Um, but again, you're, you're going to start to feel some menopausal symptoms, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Erin is asking, she's BRCA2 positive, and she said, in your experience, what would you recommend to do first, a uh, prophylactic bilateral mastectomy or a hysterectomy? Yeah, so part of it depends on your family history. So if in your family you had a lot of breast cancer, then that, that's probably the penetrance of your BRCA2. Um, so again, we kind of go a little bit by family history. So if you have a family history of breast cancer, the risk reducing mastectomy, um, usually 10 years prior to the youngest person in your family with that particular yeah. cancer. So many patients do start with the mastectomies um, with BRCA2, remember, you develop ovarian cancer. Your risk for developing ovarian cancer is later than BRCA1. Um, so you can defer putting off the risk-reducing oophorectomy until age you know, 45 to 50. Um, BRCA1, it's earlier. So again, it depends a little bit on your family history. Um, but if there were not any ovarian cancers and it was a very heavy breast cancer, then I would start with the risk-reducing for the breast and then probably really start thinking about the risk reducing surgery for the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. Does anybody else have any other questions? I Go do. Ahead. Hi, uh, I do. Go ahead. Um, this is Sophia. Hi, doctor. Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> How are you, Tracy? Cool. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I, my situation is um, I have the BRCA2 mutation. I was diagnosed with breast cancer last uh, November, and I had my bilateral mastectomy in February. Um, uh, I did not need um, any chemotherapy or radiation but um, because my breast cancer was caught right on time. And... Um, they now are they now had me on tamoxifen so i started taking that in april and my 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 challenge right now is uh i am seeing a i'm being treated at mayo clinic here in, in phoenix arizona and i'm also seeing a naturopathic doctor to help me with my symptoms that i have taking tamoxifen and they're in disagree. She's in disagreement with my my OBGYN um, surgeon, 
because she's letting me wait until I'm, I'm 43 right now. I turned 43 in May. So she's telling that I can wait until I'm 45 to get my ovaries and my tooth removed, or I can just get my tooth removed now uh, so that I still have um, some hormones from my ovaries until I'm 45. But my naturopathic is saying, no, um, you already have breast cancer. You have a strong family history of breast cancer. I had two aunts on my dad's side. He's the one that uh, I got the gene from. Um, one of them already passed away. She passed away when she was 52. And then the other aunt, uh, she's also being treated right now. She's older. She's in her 60s now. Um, and I'm... Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what to do, basically. If I should wait until 45, I should get just my tubes and my ovaries done now. For sure, my doctors have not said anything about my uterus, about removing my uterus or getting a hysterectomy at all. They've only wanted me to do my ovaries and my tubes. Okay. Did, did I, did I miss you? I'm sorry. So you're a BRCA2? Yes, okay. I'm a BRCA2. So you have a BRCA2 mutation? I do, yeah. sir. So with BRCA2, uh, again, you can defer doing a risk-reducing um, removal of the ovaries until 45. Um, again, you are not at increased risk for uterine cancer because of your BRCA2 mutation. You're young and you're on tamoxifen. Um, so tamoxifen increases your risk, but again, it's one to a thousand to one in two thousand. So that's not an automatic for removing the uterus. Yeah, I am. I am estrogen progesterone um, so receptor. I think it's perfectly reasonable to wait and, and drive some more benefit. Pardon me. Oh, I was going to say I am also estrogen progesterone receptor positive. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you're taking the tamoxifen to combat that estrogen receptor uh, positive breast cancer. So again, I think it's reasonable. Now, there are some women who aren't able to tolerate tamoxifen or, or aren't able to appropriately suppress their estrogen levels. So sometimes their medical oncologists um, send them to me to recommend a removal of the ovaries. That's kind of a different story. But based on the BRCA2 mutation, I think it's uh, fine to wait until you're 45. Um, again, mm -hmm. you don't have to wait until you're 45. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can certainly do an early risk reduction procedure. But as far as your risk for developing ovarian cancer, um, it really starts to pick up in BRCA2 patients um, after the age of 50. So that's why we say you can kind of wait compared to BRCA1. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor. Mm -hmm. I have Tariq is asking. Uh, does removing my fallopian tubes reduce my ovarian cancer risk? I have no family history. Uh, um, affect my period to return. I had triple negative breast cancer. Finished my chemo and double mastectomy. I'm BRCA1 with no family history. So she's asking, I guess, does removing the fallopian tubes reduce the risk of ovarian cancer? So removing your fallopian tube does decrease your risk of developing cancer. Um, and so we talked about kind of as a two-step procedure, if you're not ready yet to remove your ovaries, if you have an increased risk, then removing the tubes is a reasonable first step. And there's a trial that a friend of mine is conducting called the WISP trial that's looking at that now in the U.S. Um, but did I hear that you're BRSA1 positive? Yes. So if you are BRCA1 positive, remember that greatly increases your risk of developing ovarian cancer and at an earlier age. So our BRCA1 patients, we do recommend removing the ovaries. Um, and we do recommend that kind of by age 40. So, um, you know, if you're about that age and you carry BRCA1 mutation, I would really very much recommend um, considering removing the ovaries at the same time. Lisa, you had a question? Yeah. All right, there's another part there about fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes have to do with the period. So it's the ovaries that cause the 
and the mutual perform, and that's what you do. So you still have your period, even if you remove the fallopian tubes. Perfect. Lisa? Hi. So I'm uh, BRCA1 and CHECK2 uh, positive. Um, I had a hysterectomy a year ago tomorrow, actually. And I was scheduled for my PBM in March, but now it's postponed till August now. And I'm kind of wondering, um, once I do that, um, what's if I, 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 I guess I take estrogen, um, if I put estrogen in my body, what are the chances of anything, would anything come back? Would I be able to, you know, uh, chances of breast cancer, even though I'm doing a full PBM? Yeah, and so without a personal breast cancer history, um, um, in a premenopausal woman, it seems reasonable to use hormone replacement therapy. Um, in a postmenopausal patient, um, there's a concern about a potential increased risk. Um, if you're using estrogen alone, that risk is less than the combination of estrogen and progesterone. Also, a woman who carries a beer mutation, I think very reasonable to use hormone replacement therapy. I think the harder question becomes, okay, once you reach that, you know, what to do after that. Um, remember, it's safe, but there is an increased risk and there are side effects hormone replacement therapy, including potentially developing a blood clot, things like that. So once you're menopausal, then you have to think, okay, what are my goals here of hormone replacement therapy? Um, you were going to enter menopause at some point. Once you reach that age, then are the potential benefits of estrogen, which are the, they are. It helps protect your heart, help protect your bones, you feel better. Um, are those benefits enough to outweigh the risk of potentially increasing your risk of a breast cancer, recognizing you've already gone through so much to avoid that? You had a risk-reducing surgery, you had a risk-reducing hysterectomy, oophorectomy, uh, mastectomy, so you've done you know, pretty significant significant things in your life to reduce that risk are the benefits enough. And what are the benefits you're trying to do from estrogen? Is it hot flashes? Again, they're non hormonal things we can do to help you with hot flashes and hot flashes will eventually get better. Um, is it vaginal dryness? So there are other things that we can use for vaginal dryness, like I talked before, replans. You can also use topical estrogen to the vagina. Um, it's a lower dose and less systemic uptake. So again, that will help with vaginal dryness and have less risk than systemic estrogen. Is it cardiac health? And then again, exercise, diet will help. Is it bone health, calcium and vitamin D, as well as weight bearing exit help. So you have to kind of think of what is my goal of taking this replacement therapy, um, especially in a woman who's at increased risk and has already done so much to decrease her risk of developing a breast cancer. Yeah, I'm going, I'm actually going through menopause. So I had the hysterectomy. Did that answer your question, Lisa? Uh, yes, I was just um, okay. I was just saying. So the the hot flashes and stuff actually, before the hysterectomy were kind of going away. Then I had the hysterectomy, and they came back a little bit worse and night sweats and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Dr. And that's not uncommon because the estrogen ovaries still produce a little bit of estrogen. Um, there again is a non. You can take it's Grisdale. Um, and you can ask your doctor about that. And see if that'll give some relief. Yeah, what was that? Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Risdale. Risdale. I'm taking paroxetine. Yeah, that's it, right? And that helps with. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So again, nothing makes it 100, percent um, but at least it helps them be less frequent and less intense, and it, it will get better. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions for Dr. Diaz? Just one more. <laughs> um, so I have a daughter and she's 16. Obviously I'm concerned about the gene and because I, they found ovarian cancer in me so early, but they will not test her yeah. for the, the BRCA gene until she's um, 18. What do you recommend as far as like yeah. prevention for her? What can I do? and I got diagnosed it. And then yeah. I have one other question. Sorry, I agree. Question. I wouldn't test her. Okay. Sure. No testing. Uh, um, so I would recommend she goes on birth control pills. 
um, birth control pills will decrease her risk of developing ovarian cancer. Really? So I know she's 16. Um, but again, I would have the talk about the idea behind the birth control pills is oh not boy. to, you know, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's what I recommend. Absolutely. And, and the one other question is, I know it's weird going from mom to sex, but that's like, this is this, the situation we're all in, right? Once you have, one of the things that I've noticed since yeah. I had my hysterectomy is I have absolutely no, like, I don't know if that's part of the menopause, there's no drive left. What are, what are some, some things that you're supposed to do to kind of, you know, I don't know if that's a medical thing. Yeah, no, that, that's one of the issues, right? You have this change in your hormones. And so um, that one is not an easy fix. Um, again, one of the challenges is with a personal industry of uh, cancer, you really want to limit the amount of hormones you use. So I know that some women use testosterone supplementation um, to help with their libido. The concern there is, again, excess testosterone in a woman is going to get converted to estrogen. Uh, and that estrogen, again, the concern there is that could that be feeding uh, potential breast cancer or brain cancer cells left behind. Um, so you're right. That's one of the challenging things with libido. Um, one of the other things that are challenging if you're in a long-term relationship, you know, the spontaneity sometimes leaves that relationship. So it does require more effort, um, does require more date night, which we can't do during COVID, um, but it does re require a little bit more romance, a little bit more time to get in the mood, the spontaneity and things like that just aren't happening in long relationships and then take away some of the hormones. So you need to make sure that you talk to your partner about some of these things. So your partner doesn't think that it's something with them. Um, and then work with your partner to make it um, what's going to bring you in the mood. And that be, you know, again, setting up date night. Um, and if it's got to be in COVID times, you know, set up for a time for massage or something like that, something that's going to help get you in the mood um, if you're having difficulty with spontaneity, which again, is not unique um, to yeah. women. I see a lot of my patients struggle with this, both with brain cancer, even just the history inhibits it because of anxiety. So uh, it's gonna take more work for you and your partner. Um, well, I'm single, so fit. I'm single, so uh, it's gonna be hard to get a partner when I'm like, <laughs> but okay. So, you know, light some candles up. <laughs> <laughs> Make time for yourself. But yeah. Yasmin, you had a question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, doctor, for all this. Uh, I just have a question. I'm Baraka one. Uh, triple I have done with triple negative. I did double mastectomy. But the thing is, my genetic testing, uh, I have no, no history at all. Uh, of, of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, from both sides. Um, my mm -hmm. question is uh, on the my genetic testing. I'm at, in exon twenty, which is the end. So I'm not sure is this reduce my risk, like because I'm not in the main cluster uh, ovarian cancer. Um, yeah, this is my question. Yeah, and so did they they have a genetic result? available for you when you saw the genetic counselor? Yes, yes, I had the Baraka one, yeah. Baraka one, yeah. So um, where are you living now? I'm in Australia. In Australia, okay. That's so cool. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, it's kind of uh, Dr. Obermeyer is in Australia. He's an excellent, yeah, Dr. Obermeyer is in Australia. He's an excellent G1 oncologist. Um, and I think the important thing is to get in with a good geneticist, a clinical geneticist, to help explain what your risks are. Um, but again, with BRCA1 mutations, you're at increased risk of both ovarian cancer and should develop an endometrial cancer, increased risk of that being a serious cancer. Um, so I would talk about the role for risk-reducing surgery um, with your gynecologist or find yourself a good geneticist to talk about those risks. Okay, so I'm this like I'm now deciding that I will be removing only my fallopian tubes. I'm just 41, so I don't know if this really because I read okay. some studies that it it re, like reduced 70 percent. I don't know if this is true or. Yeah, so we don't know how much removing the fallopian tubes alone reduces your risk. We know it reduces your risk. Um, 
So I understand your reservation being only 41. Um, what I would say is that's a good start if you're not ready to remove the ovaries, to remove the fallopian tubes, and then make sure some surveillance. So I would recommend a general ultrasound and a C125 tumor marker every six months. Um, but I think you, know, you should have a timeline as far as to when to proceed with removing of the ovaries. Um, remember, we do ultrasounds and we do some N25s, but they don't really work. And ovarian cancer, when we do find it, we find it at an advanced stage. And so it's treatable, um, but the reality is it's very hard to cure advanced ovarian cancer. So I think your reservations are very warranted, um, but I, I do think that um, you're at significant risk. Uh, with a BRCA1 mutation, uh, and that risk starts uh, in the early 40s. So you're kind of there. Um, so I understand not being ready to remove the ovaries. At a minimum, I'd remove the fallopian tubes, start your screening ultrasounds and C125, but I think you need to start um, considering that at some point in the next few years, you really need to remove those ovaries uh, and eliminate your risk of a disease that you have about a 40% chance of developing. Um, that's hard to cure. Dr. Diaz, can you see the question that was just sent? Do you see the chat or no? Can you see it? Yeah. Um, so NuvaRing is fine. Remember NuvaRing. So the, I'm sorry. The, did you guys see the question? So the question was, is the NuvaRing okay, or should you be on the birth control pill for risk-reducing uh, strategies? So NuvaRing is fine. NuvaRing, remember, has both estrogen and progesterone. So the whole idea of being on birth control pills is one of the thoughts is every month the ovary, you ovulate, it ruptures, it releases an egg, it fixes itself, does it again the next month, does it again. And it's that constant rupture that can cause damage to the ovary and can lead to an ovarian cancer. So by being on birth control pills or the NuvaRing, you inhibit ovulation, so you're no longer releasing that egg every month. The IUD is different. The IUD does not inhibit ovulation. Even the IUD with hormone, it's just a progesterone to act locally, does not inhibit ovulation. So the IUD is not good risk-reducing strategy, but any hormones, either the birth control pill, the transdermal patch, or NuvaRing, anything that's gonna suppress ovulation um, will help with decreasing your risk of developing ovarian cancer. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Diaz, for coming on the call and giving us continued education and updated information. Um, we're th very thankful here at Brock and Strong, again, for your continuous dedication and always willing to come on and help us after your patients or surgery day. So thank you again, and we look forward to having you back on another time. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Diaz. Thank you, guys. Be well. Have a great long weekend. You too. You too. Enjoy. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for organizing. You're welcome. <laughs> A lot of great information. Oh, my gosh. Great. <laughs> but, you know, I think that it was broken down. Yeah. I, I, like, the way it was break, broken down, I think, ended fabulous. Like, you were walking away with a lot of information, and I think that for us on the call and all the women that were on there, you know, now have better options.